Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I want to welcome you all to our Independent Policy Forum this evening uh, and for braving the rain. And I hear the traffic is a little intense. Uh, but we have a book on that, by the way, if you're interested, uh, <laughs> called Street Smart. You name the topic. Um, we, uh, we hold the uh, Independent Policy Forum uh, here and also in our office in Washington on a regular basis. And uh, the forum, for those of you who have not been here before, is a series of lectures and debates and seminars on different issues involving uh, top scholars and other experts. And we're delighted to uh, have our program this evening, which, as you may recall, is called Why Are Politicians Always Trying to Scare Us? And our speaker this evening is Robert Higgs, who is the author of the new book, Neither Liberty Nor Safety, Fear, Ideology, and the Growth of Government. For those who also are new, as well as those who've been here before, uh, hopefully you got a copy of the packet when you registered. You'll find information about our book programs, as well as uh, upcoming events. Uh, we invite you to go to our website, which is independent.org. You'll find an awful lot of material, including articles from past issues of our journal, The Independent Review, which Dr. Higgs is also the editor of. Uh, I'm also pleased that uh, one of our uh, associate editors, Andy Rutten, is here with us tonight uh, from Stanford. And um, the, the institute, as you may know, is a uh, academic public policy research institute. We produce lots of books. We have a quarterly journal called The Independent Review, and this is a recent issue. Um, and uh, the Institute gets involved in many conference and media projects. And there's really no area of government policy that we might not deal with, nor area of, uh, of public discussion or issue. For tonight, um, as, as I'm sure you have gathered, um, uh, it seems like it's been since ancient times that politicians and bureaucrats and interest groups and others have gained resources and control over the public by playing to people's fears of various crises. And uh, our speaker tonight is, is well regarded for an earlier book he did called Crisis and Leviathan. And this fear mongering uh, is part of a, of a process which Dr. Higgs will talk about. Um, and the idea is that only these people can offer solutions to these problems. Um, but uh, it seems that the solutions often, if not always, make the problems worse. So the tactic has been facilitated by um, a widespread belief that gaining economic, military, and personal security um, requires uh, sacrificing liberty and the rule of law and so forth. Uh, so the idea is not just to, to frighten people, but to make this institutionalized in society. The title of the book, um, as you may have gathered, is from a quote by Benjamin Franklin, uh, in which he said, those who would give up essential freedom to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety, unquote. So in his new book, um, Dr. Higgs is examining how fear-mongering by politicians and their allies erodes people's willingness and ability to govern themselves. And the question is, was Franklin right uh, or was he wrong or was he exaggerating uh, this idea that there is no real trade-off between freedom and security? In the aftermath of 9-11 and looking at issues ranging from global warming to health care, whatever we see almost on a daily basis in the media and elsewhere, uh, some sort of fear that seems to be driving public discussion. Our speaker tonight is Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute. He's also editor, as I said, of the Independent Review. He received his PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> And he's a recipient of many awards, most recently the Gary Schlombaum Award for a Lifetime Defense of Liberty from the Von Mises Institute. Some of you may have been here almost exactly a year ago where Bo when Bob received the Thomas Zaz Award for outstanding contributions to the cause of civil liberties. He's also received the Lysander Spooner Award, the Friedrich von Wieser Memorial Prize for Excellence in Economic Education, and the Templeton Honor Rolls Award for Education in a Free Society. He's the editor of many books. Um, 
Here's one that we featured at our last event called Opposing the Crusader State. Uh, he's also the, the co-editor of a number of other institute books, including The Challenge of Liberty and Rethinking Green, all of which he's co-edited co-edit with um, my colleague Carl Close. Uh, his other books that he's edited included, include Hazardous to Our Health on the FDA, and uh, one of my favorites, actually, called Arms Politics and the Economy on the U.S. Defense Establishment. And, of course, in addition to his new book, Neither Liberty Nor Safety, he's the author of many other books, um, including Depression, War, and Cold War, uh, Resurgence of the Warfare State Against Leviathan, Competition and Coercion, and, as I mentioned, Crisis in Leviathan. He's the author of at least 100 articles in scholarly journals, many popular articles in major papers like the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, and elsewhere. And you'll find many of his commentaries all over the web uh, these days. So I'm really pleased to uh, present, once again, Bob Higgs. Thank you very much, David. I've reached a stage in life where I have to make a choice between uh, seeing you and not seeing my notes or vice versa. <laughs> so uh, I hope I won't be too uh, annoying if I'm putting on my glasses when I decide to have a look at you and uh, taking them off when I need to look at my notes. Uh, I remember going for years watching speakers who did that, and I thought, that's annoying. Why do these guys do that? But uh, <laughs> now I know. Uh, so um, I've, I, I've written this book, as David said, and, uh, and he also mentioned I, I, I've written other books, uh, and... I'm sure many people are asking, how can we stop him uh, so, <laughs> before he writes again? And, uh, and so I, I'd like to give you a, a fairly firm promise that there, there won't be much in the future <laughs> that, uh, that I think I've uh, just about had my say, and uh, maybe I've had my say over and over and over. And so if uh, I say things tonight that sound familiar to many of you, and you say, well, he's been saying that for 25 years. Uh, I apologize in advance, but, but uh, <clears throat> I find that many people haven't taken these things to heart. And so I keep saying them in hopes that uh, even more people will pay attention to them and take them to heart and perhaps act accordingly, because uh, what I discovered in, uh, in the past uh, six years or so was that uh, after 9-11, uh, when it looked as if we, we had the uh, potential for another crisis similar to those that had uh, occasioned spurts of uh, government growth in the past, uh, I responded to, uh, to inquiries from journalists and other people by saying that, yes, I think here's what's going to happen, because uh, these things have followed a certain pattern in the past, and we now have the potential for them to follow exactly that same pattern again, and, uh, and they did. They followed <laughs> almost the same pattern as in the past in essential ways. Of course, every episode is distinct in its details, and uh, the past uh, uh, six years are, are certainly different from, say, uh, what happened during the Great Depression or what happened during uh, either of the World Wars, but uh, in the way that I've analyzed uh, what I call the ratchet phenomenon in the growth of government, uh, they're all the same. Uh, they all work in essentially the same way and for the same reasons. And that's why I was in a position to make some forecasts in, uh, in actually in, in September of 2001 uh, that are on record as what I thought would happen that I think have proven to be, unfortunately, all too accurate uh, as events have unfolded. Uh, it's not because I had some powers of prophecy or because I'm a seer 
Uh, it's just uh, that uh, there's a certain logic in the way politics operate. And if you study history long enough, you, you begin to get a sense of what that logic is and to see that it continues to apply in certain <coughs> circumstances. And those conditions exist today. And I'll say a little bit about, <coughs> about more about that as I go along tonight. Now, now the, uh, the title the, for tonight's uh, forum that David, David gave is why, why are politicians always trying to scare us? And uh, <laughs> we could actually dispose of this very quickly and go back and have some more wine. <laughs> By, uh, by simply referring to the great H.L. Mencken, uh, who, who uh, among probably millions of quotable statements, uh, said the following. Uh, he said, the, uh, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins all of them imaginary. Now, Mencken was a master of, uh, of graceful hyperbole, and, uh, and yet I'd say that statement is at least 90% truth along with 10% hyperbole. Uh, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety. Uh, because uh, that puts them in a position to be exploited more effectively by the politicians and their supporters, which is what politics is for, after all. Uh, many people have romantic notions of what politics is for, but uh, I'm going to try to cut to the chase tonight and talk about what I think basically goes on in politics. Let me say, first of all, that uh, the reason I've focused on fear directly uh, in this recent book and in some of my other writing lately, uh, more so than in the past, in which I've, I've spoken about crises of different kinds, and it was obvious that in those crises, such as the World Wars and the Great Depression, many people were afraid, uh, afraid of foreign enemies or afraid of, uh, of loss of employment or income or something during the Depression. Uh, I, di I didn't try to go any, any lower down. I didn't try to, try to uh, get down to discussing uh, fear <clears throat> at its most basic uh, level in, in the abstract. But uh, I, I've tried to do that more in the last few years. Uh, fear, fear is very effective because fear is the strongest emotion human beings feel. Uh, we feel all, all sorts of emotions, of course. Uh, we, we feel love, we feel compassion and lust and what have you. But, but none of them can compete with fear because when people are uh, possessed by fear, it overrides everything else. Uh, and included in that everything else is rational thought. Uh, pe when people react uh, in fear, they react, as it were, automatically, the way animals do. Fear. Uh, operates at the most elemental level that we human beings as animals uh, uh, can act at. And so uh, it, uh, it causes us to act quickly and without a lot of thought, almost instinctively, not rationally. Uh, and that's good in a way because if, if, if we didn't have this capacity, we probably could not have survived. Fear serves a purpose. Uh, uh, as Darwin would say, uh, if you're not afraid, uh, then you don't react to threats and, and you may uh, succumb to them. Uh, so fear is not something we can get rid of, uh, nor, nor should we. We, we. we wouldn't want to get rid of fear. Aristotle said uh, a man would be crazy not to fear anything, uh, earthquakes <laughs> or, the, or the waves. Uh, and I think he was quite correct, uh, but, but fear can, can be misused, exploited, it can be cultivated, it can be heightened, it can be turned into a political resource, and that's, that's what I'm going to say something about tonight. Now, I'm going to talk about fear in relation to politics, and in particular in, in relation to the fact that, that uh, societies have rulers and they have ruled people. Uh, 
the people who have the effrontery to rule us call themselves the government. Now, they understand about fear. They exploit it and cultivate it. And whether they compose a welfare state or a warfare state, uh, they depend on, on fear to secure uh, popular submission and compliance with official dictates and on some occasions uh, cooperation with their, uh, their enterprises and adventures. And I maintain that without popular fear, no government could endure more than 24 hours. If we weren't afraid of anything, what would we need with government? We would all be able to rely on our own actions and measures and devices. Uh, uh, we might cooperate with others in the process, but we wouldn't need what we know as government. What we know as government is, uh, <clears throat> is basically organized robbery. Now, uh, when we talk about the bedrock of government, uh, many, many learned people over the ages have, have maintained that government rests on public opinion. In fact, this goes back for centuries that we can find people uh, maintaining this position. Certainly, uh, David Hume is one of the most famous uh, people to develop the thought that all government rests on public opinion. Uh, but many others have endorsed uh, his argument uh, I, I'm going to maintain that public opinion, uh, I'm not going to dispute what Hume and others have said, but to, but to maintain that but public opinion is not uh, the rock bottom, that there's something even below public opinion, uh, and that that something is fear, more primordial, deeper. Murray Rothbard, uh, in his uh, brilliant essay on the anatomy of the state, uh, considered fear, but he did not consider it the foundation of government. He considered it one device among several that governments use to keep people in line. Uh, another successful device, he called it, to uh, obtain people's acquiescence in their domination. Uh, every ideology endows government uh, with legitimacy requires, however, I maintain, and is infused by some kinds of fear. Uh, fear is a necessary, though perhaps not a sufficient condition for the viability of government as we know it. Of course, ideologies involve not just fears, but hopes. Uh, but when we look at what it is people hope for, we can often see that what they hope for is release from their fears. <laughs> and, uh, a very interesting writer named David Altide, I'm not sure he pronounces his name that way, but uh, David Altide uh, has remarked that people do want to be saved and freed, but they want to be saved and freed from fear. And this is what uh, makes the mass media's messages of fear so compelling and important for public policy and the fabric of our social life, end quote. Uh, Altide has written a very interesting book on how uh, the mass media contribute to the maintenance of a, a state of chronic fear and apprehension in modern populations. And uh, for years I've been struck by this phenomenon. <clears throat> I, 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 once upon a time, I used to uh, watch while eating my lunch uh, something called headline news. Now, this is not what I would call a highly intellectual news program. <laughs> uh, something like the USA Today version of, uh, of the news. Uh, but uh, yeah, I watched it to... Uh, to just find out whether something, something truly big might have happened that day that I needed to take note of. But as I watched it day after day, I, I, I became aware after a while that, that there, was, there was always some story on headline news that I eventually called the fear du jour. 
Uh, there, were, there was always some new threat that they had just announced, you know. A, a scientist had discovered that uh, pigeon flu was about to kill us all, or that there was some new toxin in the water in Newark, and, uh, and uh, it looked as if it, it would wipe out New Jersey by sundown. And uh, every, every day it was something like this, and, and it, almost every day a new one, too. Uh, the endless number of fears de jour. Uh, and so after a while, I got ready. I got primed. It was like a research project. And I said, okay, what'll it be today? Right? <laughs> now, now, of course, in retrospect, it's interesting that the world's population has not been wiped out yet despite hundreds of CNN uh, warnings that it was impending, uh, that, you know, here we are more numerous than ever with higher incomes and standards of living. How could this be? Uh, I don't know how we managed to uh, avoid uh, all of these horrible fates that uh, the, the uh, television producers had, had in mind for us day by day. There's an old, old uh, saying in the newspaper business, if it bleeds, it leads. Okay? So if there's been a murder, or, uh, uh, there's been a, 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 a fire, you know, any, any, any horrible bad thing that's happened, that's what gets the headline on the front page. Uh, and uh, of course, television news people do the same thing. Uh, f for six years, I, I lived in uh, a little town north of Philadelphia, and I'd watch the nightly news on a Philadelphia TV station, and, and my wife and I ca came to, to refer to the fire, uh, because every night on TV there was a, a fire story. It's as if, you know, uh, there weren't enough warehouses in Philadelphia to keep this going. Uh, but, but every night another one would burn up, and, and there would be tremendous film footage of these flames leaping into the night air. <laughs> Apparently people never tire of these images, and uh, uh, it, it, it can become almost humorous after a while, but I think we need to appreciate that it serves a purpose, that it gets people used to a chronic state of apprehension of, of thinking that there are bad things out there happening and they could happen to me. W without their thinking too hard about what the odds are that they're going to happen to you. Right? It's true, there's, you know, there are quite a few murders every day in the United States. But it's a country of 300 million people. What are the odds? Somebody's going to murder you tomorrow. Not very high, particularly if you stay out of certain parts of town. <laughs> Your odds are very good indeed then. So, uh, so the media are very important. I, you know, it, if it bleeds, it leads. And I have my own little saying for television, uh, uh, which is, uh, what, whatever may terrorize, we prioritize. <laughs> Uh, just think how many terrorism threats we've had discussed or announced on, on the television since September 11, 2001, and yet there hasn't been another terrorist incident since then in this country. So I'm sure we're all getting impatient <laughs> for the next one.